a world-famous coral reef ecosystem threatened by pollution. A 2,000-year-old culture in danger of extinction. American democratic ideals overturned by U.S. military policy. A Pacific Island people fighting for their sovereignty and resources in a global corporate economy bent on short-term profit at any price. This is the story of Palau, a microcosm of the planetary survival challenges facing us all. The Republic of Palau is an archipelago of over 200 islands near the Philippines. Its 15,000 citizens share an ancient matrilineal culture that has thrived for millennia. A conservator culture committed to preserving Palau's unique resources and ecosystems for all future generations. Hundreds of species of fish and corals are found in Palau, many times more than found in the Caribbean or the Great Barrier Reef. For Palau is close to the tropical West Pacific Center of Biological Diversity, the area with the greatest variety of marine life forms in the world. Surrounded by the world's best fishing waters, Palauans have had a reputation as Micronesia's finest fishermen. For over 2,000 years, Palauans were self-sufficient in the natural abundance here. But now, the survival of Palau's culture and ecology is severely threatened. Palau's government has signed a compact with Washington, giving the U.S. military rights to their land and sea for at least 50 years. And though officials call it the world's newest independent nation, Palau remains a zip code in the U.S. postal system. And, like other indigenous peoples around the world, Palauans are facing the impact of fast-track development for transnational exploitation. They are caught in a game of global players who have no stake in the survival of local cultures and environments. The challenge Will there be short-term profit for foreign investors and their few Palauan partners? Or sustainable development for all Palauans? Can Palauans reclaim control of their nation and resources? How do they successfully combine the best of their traditions with the best of the modern age? This documentary looks at these issues through the work of several Palauan activists who are rising to the challenge. When you look at sort of the history of the Pacific Islands, when you look at how many colonizers colonized Micronesia, different countries and big metropolitan countries that were so super, super patriarchal countries. You're talking about Spain, you're talking about Germany, you're talking about Japan, you know, and you're talking about now America. What we have now is very typical of uh, what you see in the United States. You know, you have businessmen who are policy makers. Whatever fruits that we, we may be able to reap through investment, development, are, are meant for plants and investors. We might end up becoming victims of multinationals and other uh, big business from the outside. I don't think it's going, it's going to be a honeymoon for, you know, for us in the United States. I don't think so. It's wrong to deny the people the right to their own land. Now we're, we're becoming semi-independent, so our, our challenge is how are we going to reach our visions that we've been talking about, you know, mm -hmm. how do we get there? I think there's hope.
These boats are taking Palauan elders and their families to a weekend of ceremonies commemorating cooperation between two island villages during the Second World War. The destination is the island of Peleliu, scene of the war's bloodiest battles. For Makem Weirs, nurse, poet, mother of three, this voyage is part of a personal journey. I've lived away from Palau for more than 28 years in California, still having my heart in Palau all these years. I've always yearned to return. This trip is going to be a spiritual journey, returning back to my roots, the sources of my cultural strength that has sustained me while I've been away. My hope is to reaffirm my traditional values so I can pass them on to the next generation. I hope that the Palau I left almost 30 years ago will still be there. I don't know if this will happen. So in some form, it is a contemplative journey to unknown aspects of Palau I haven't seen. Japanese caves from World War II still honeycomb parts of Peleliu. They're bones. They're human bones. I don't want to touch them. Human bones are not the only reminders of that time. Children play in a fortified cave pool. <laughs> On beaches where thousands died, picnicking grandmothers who were girls during the war burst into dance to renew the ties of shared hardship and joy that connect their two distant villages. Preparation for the feasting has taken days. The entire village of Narard from the island of Babeldop has come to visit. Fifty years ago, they gave refuge to the people of Peleliu when it became a battle zone. And the feasting is just preparation for the dancing, which goes on into the night. Traditional dances that have borrowed elements from all Palau's past colonizers. Traditionally, a harmonious relationship was one of the very high value of Palawan society. And that harmony also extends to the land and to the resources of the sea and the air we breathe in. Land was considered very sacred and we, even our own term is said, uh, mother, we call the land mother. September 15th, 1944, United States Marines hit the beaches of Peleliu. Control of Palau passed to the U.S. in World War II when GIs took it from the Japanese, who had taken it from the Germans, 
who had taken it from the Spanish, who had taken it from the Palauans in the first place. When the war was over, Americans deliberately destroyed Palau's extensive Japanese-built road, electrical, and water systems. The decline from economic self-sufficiency to dependence had begun. The meeting is open. In the post-war period, under the United Nations, Palau and the rest of Micronesia were made a strategic trust territory of the United States, moving the western boundary of America to within a few hundred miles of the Asian mainland. Confronted with American might and promises, islanders were forced to give up their ancestral homelands. Then, under U.S. control, part of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, became until the 60s ground zero for a series of 66 above-ground nuclear blasts. The ancient island people watched as radiation damaged their culture, lands, and genetic heritage beyond repair, or compensation. My nation was once a colony, and we know what colonialism means. The exploitation and subjugation of the weak by the powerful, of the many by the few, of the governed who have given no consent to be governed. World opinion after World War II was against colonialism. So the U.S. administration set about to engineer Micronesian consent to be governed. President Kennedy appointed a commission to detail a plan. It was headed by Harvard's Anthony M. Solomon. His report said the solution was money. With that, the new frontier went to Micronesia. The islands Palau, particularly, much like the rest of Micronesia, have become very dependent entities of a sort. And uh, any decision-making process that took place was very much conditioned by this uh, economic dependence that had been created. Would the U.S. have purposely created economic dependence in Micronesia? In 1971, a student journal, The Young Micronesian, made public for the first time leaked portions of the Solomon Report which sent shockwaves through the territory. The plan to engineer consent to be governed by the U.S. was exposed. It laid out, quote, an integrated master plan for bringing Micronesia into permanent affiliation with the United States. The Solomon Report advised the use of carefully managed voting, American education, and economic leverage. It also identified up-and-coming young Micronesian leaders for cultivation and training in the U.S. Time passed in the trust territory. American education and television sold Palauans on an affluent Western lifestyle and official American ideals. U.S. economic leverage over Palau increased. In 1979, Palauans wrote a national constitution. The wisdom, distilled from 2,000 years of oral culture, was translated into a 20th century document establishing Palau as a sovereign nation. It codified Palau's conservator culture, Palauans' right to protect and manage their own lands, ocean, and lives. In response to the nuclear destruction in the Marshalls, Japan, and Tahiti, Pacific nations were declaring nuclear-free zones. After decades of nuclear bomb testing in their region by the United States, Britain, and France, a people's movement for a nuclear-free and independent Pacific was growing. Palau's precedent-setting constitution became world-famous. It protected Palau from all the poisonous weapons of the modern world. The Constitution further stated that only by a vote of 75% could this clause be removed. Though 92% of Palauans had approved their Constitution, U.S. authorities objected, fearing the spread of sovereign nuclear free zones, and made them vote on it two more times. Palauans refused to give up the clauses protecting their land, ocean, and environment. And so began the battle of wills between Palau and the superpower that was to last for over a decade. 
at no point in these internal U.S. government discussions did anyone say those guys have to change the Constitution because there was an alternative. The alternative was if they didn't change the Constitution, we wouldn't negotiate free association. A compact of free association between Palau and the United States was proposed to replace the trusteeship. It was in conflict with Palau's constitution. In return for $450 million in aid, it gave the U.S. military rights to Palauan land and sea and violated Palau's weapons ban. There are lots of other places in the world where we have military bases or where our aircraft or ships travel where the people in whose territory we're operating would love to have us say we are not going to bring in nuclear weapons. And if we agree to it once, so the feeling of many successive American administrations has been, if we agree to it in one place, we cannot resist having that done to us elsewhere. You need to understand the U.S. policy and U.S. mentality as to how this island should be developed in order to, to fight. Educational Administrator Bernie Kelderman campaigned for over a decade to preserve the environmental and political protections built into Palau's constitution. With her organization Tal Rong, she fought to give Palauans information about the implications of the compact. We were confused and, and we were forced and we were threatened to, to follow uh, what the government was trying to tell us. Through the 80s, attorney Roman Bedore co-led the court battle to uphold Palau's constitution. Like his sister Bernie Kelderman, family and community pressures, death threats, and the murder of their father failed to stop his activism. If you look at the first referendum on the Hampa, there were a lot of money that were poured out into the communities. We had barbecue all over the islands. People were paid. That did not work. And I think that the next uh, strategy for the campaign was the, to use the intimidation and force. One of the young leaders targeted for cultivation by Washington in the 1960s Solomon Report had been Lazarus Salih. By the 80s, Lazarus Salih was Palau's chief compact negotiator. First as ambassador, then as president, he attempted to engineer compact passage with an increasingly heavy hand. So heavy, in fact, that Palau's legislature asked the international human rights community to send election observers. Canadian, Swedish, Danish, Native American, and Hawaiian human rights groups sent veteran observers. We give them uh, as much as we can give them. I believe the Palauans are on the brink of discovering that their land policies um, may be influenced a great deal by a large nation like the United States, and that they no longer would be the owners of Palau, but may give up the right to their homeland, to outside investors and foreigners to take ownership in the future. We have today in Hawaii the example of that kind of um, land tenure system that's changed drastically. We no longer are the keepers of our land. And I, uh, I am very afraid for Palauans and the land tenure system is theirs right now. Tomorrow, 
it may not be. The women elders decided to assert their role as Palau's traditional leaders and defend the country's constitution and land rights. Gabriela Nirmong is one of the highest ranking women in Palauan society. Women are landowners in Palau. They produce the staple food, the taro. Powerful in traditional Palauan politics, they chose the chiefs and could remove them. The women elders filed a lawsuit in Palau's court. They challenged what they believe were illegal moves to change their constitution. And they knew it would hold up the compact. But hours before they were due in court, someone hurled a firebomb at their leader's home. President Salih had turned up the heat. He furloughed government workers without pay until the compact was approved. Furloughed workers camped outside the national legislature, demanding compact passage. An angry gang, covertly funded by Salih, threatened journalists. You have to leave this country within 24 hours. Houses of Constitution supporters were firebombed. Bador Bin's father of Bernie and Roman was murdered. His killers were never brought to justice. The hearing will come to order. What, what would you have this committee do? What do you think we should do? What uh, our group wants your committee to work on is that to keep the Congress from ratifying the Compact of Free Association until we resolve the internal court process. Well, but a suit hasn't been filed yet. We will. Or it was, uh, I just told you that we will definitely would uh, file a lawsuit. And when will that be done? What's the hurry? <laughs> it's our future. Isabella Sumong is a high school teacher who was drafted by the women elders as their spokeswoman. The experience turned her into an international activist. I declare open the 55th session of the Trusteeship Council. We have already had a very bitter experience of destruction of our peace by the compact process. I just attended the United Nations Trusteeship Council. I was petitioning on behalf of uh, our organization, a group of women. Uh, militarism, colonialism, taking all away of lands from the people are, are injustice. So we're here to ask these people, good people, people from the United States, to take action against the, the wrongdoings of their government. Thank you very much. I believe that when it's wrong, it's wrong, and it's never going to be right. So. If we don't do it now, then maybe the next generation will pick it up and take it from there. Palau is the only entity in Micronesia that had to have three referendums on the Constitution. We had to have seven or eight referendums on the Free Association. Six plebiscites had been held attempting to change the Constitution. But since 75% voter approval was required to overturn Palau's protective clauses, None of the plebiscites succeeded. By 1986, the three other Micronesian nations had all given military rights to the United States. The U.S. declared the trust territory terminated. Still, Palau's standoff with Washington continued. To the tune of Old Lang Syne, the flag of the trust territories was lowered and the flag of the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas raised. The last formality on the last day of the Trust Territories for the last High Commissioner. But I'm sad because I'm leaving. Just real sad. But I'm happy because you're a full-fledged Commonwealth. We did it. It's done. You're on your own and you're a wonderful addition to the United States of America. The whole compact of free association that's being pushed down the throats of people in the Marshalls, in the Federated States of Micronesia and Palau, is really uh, an attempt 
or one of the fine one of the stages in the annexation of Micronesia. Uh, what we see being done, in fact, is one of the um, greatest colonial land grabs uh, in current history. Our forward peacetime presence is represented by over 110,000 Navy and Marine Corps men and women. This forward naval presence extends from Central America to West Africa, from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean, from the Sea of Japan throughout the Pacific. A visible reminder of America's commitment to our allies. From Guam and American Samoa in the Pacific to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean, island peoples have been forced to give up their sovereignty for the U.S. military and economic agenda. Pentagon maps show how vast the U.S. military presence would be. Jungle warfare training ground, nuclear weapons dump, an upgraded airport, and the best deep water ports taken by the U.S. What the staff of this committee found was that compact supporters were, be were behind the violence. And that they had used government resources to intimidate compact opponents to deny them access to the courts, to deny them their rights under Palauan law. No investigation, no compact, said DeLugo. The probe's chief target would have been Lazarus Salih himself. On August 20th, 1988, he was found with a bullet in his head. The official ruling? Suicide. The compact's chief proponent had become another of its victims. Palau's 1992 election was to become a turning point for the Constitution and compact politics. But public focus and attention was on the excitement of the general election. Everyone seemed to be either running for office or campaigning. Candidates and clan loyalties overshadowed the complicated judicial question that was also on the ballot. The question was, could a simple majority overturn the constitutional clause instead of the required 75 percent? After all these plebiscites, could a majority of just 50 plus 1 legally overturn requirements originally made by 92 percent? Presidential candidate and businessman Kuniwo Nakamura owns Palau's shipping terminal. But I think government is meant for grassroots. And the problems now are, especially nowadays, in Palau are grassroots problems, so more than these people at the top. If I do get in, it's because of the grassroots. Palau is meant for plants. I'm sorry to say this, but it's meant for Palauans, and, and uh, I don't want to see it change. I don't want to see it invaded, if I may use the word, the lack of good words, but uh, by outsiders, by Filipinos, by Chinese, by Japanese, by Americans, by other people. Such a small country. The issues that were on the minds of the candidates this election foreshadowed concerns that would dominate Palauan politics in the 90s. Still without an economic base, Palauans had differing visions of how to develop. Businesses. A lot of Palauans own a lot of land in Babelgao. It's vacant, it's idle. I think uh, from the experience of Guam and Saipan, a lot of Palawans would like to lease their lands or use their property as, as, as an asset, as a contribution to some kind of a joint venture. For my part, if the compact were to be approved, I'd like to make Palau uh, some kind of a, 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 a corporate headquarters for a lot of American businesses or companies from U.S. territories or U.S. Uh, pro-U.S. countries 
established in Palau with local taxes, low local taxes, and doing business in Asia to to replace Hong Kong because Hong Kong's lease expires in 1997, and they're looking for a favorable uh, corporate headquarters for a lot of their businesses. From the beginning of the the breakup of the sixth district of the of Micronesia, where Saipan went on its own way. Um, Marshalls and the FSM, uh, and everybody is sort of returned home. These big elites who were uh, uh, leaders, uh, leaders in, in Palau, they return home and they've uh, they've already they've already bought lands. You know, everybody, uh, most of them have bought lands in up in Bubble Dao, here in Koror, and they've secured lands for their own personal uh, benefits. And we suspect that uh, they are working hard to to get this uh, compact uh, push through because once the uh, the plow is open uh, for uh, foreign investors uh, under the umbrella of the United States uh, protect uh, security uh, these people will be the first one to benefit because they will be the, they, they're the ones who own uh, land and lands in Palau and they're the ones who will uh, lease their land to, to foreign investors who will and, and they'll be making uh, uh, they'll be instant millionaires uh, political education process was very much narrowed down to economic factors and did not really explore the merit the merit of the document of the compact of free association the issues involved the implications and because we were economically conditioned I would say the free choice was very much undermined. Palauans were told this was their last chance to agree to the compact and get $450 million in aid for their struggling economy. When the counting was over, Kuniwo Nakamura had won the presidency, and the Constitution's celebrated and long-contested environmental and land protection clauses had been removed. The rules had been changed. The road was now clear for a simple majority to pass the compact. And that happened the following year. This time, court challenges brought by the women elders were of no avail. We have amended. To me, it was amended illegally through a legal process, but at least it was amended. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that we have amended it. You know, for the last 10 years, these women have been trying to stop the compact from being implemented. They actually wanted no compact at all. And so we are still very unhappy. And we wanted, we keep asking ourselves, what could we have done? Or what could have happened? Um, what can be done now? Nations Development Program, Mablura Nauru, Thailand, Germany, India, Israel, Magorea, Brunei, Chile, Solanyam Lornisel, Skirsel, Lolol. And so it was that on October 1st, 1994, a gala international event was staged in Palau. The official government invitations called it a celebration of independence. Not everybody saw it that way. It's not true that we are independent. Mm. It's just the name that U.S. wants to make prove to the world was we're the last trust territory and there's no economy and they desperately want to get out of this TT deal because it will cost them more than the compact. They clever, very, very clever, you know, by using this independence name to ice, you know, all this burnt cake. And so it was that annexation, or free association, or independence, came to Palau. And with it, channeled through willing Palauan proxies, came a surge of foreign investment deals. Palau 
Mao's involvement in the globalized market economy deepened. Each year, container ships like this one offload tons of consumer goods aimed at Palauan customers. 85% of Palau's food supply is now imported. Foreign-owned businesses use Palauan resources, but many underpay or refuse to pay taxes, and most do not buy from or employ Palauans. Foreign firms and their Palauan partners have brought in Chinese and Filipino workers to sew garments for international labels. Made in Palau means a break in U.S. import tax and higher profits, but few benefits go to either the foreign workers or to Palau's economy. Foreign fishermen are licensed to fish Palauan waters, and each week, foreign-owned companies fly out thousands of tons of fish to feed Tokyo's sashimi hunger depleting Palau's fishing stocks. Only people who are doing the harvest now is Japanese, U.S. and some Taiwanese vessels under license. So it's a big ocean out there, all being harvested by foreign interests. You deal with like mecha developments and multinational corporations and where we cannot really have the control of because the, the control will be from the outside and, and not us. I think that's a danger. It's very difficult because the few businessmen who control the, the money and the development on this island at this point don't see it that way. They're just thinking mega development, millions and millions of dollars without even thinking at what point do we need to stop because we have enough uh, development already to support the government and to support our local people? If we develop and we have uh, what the economists usually use to measure so-called development in terms of per capita income, you know, if 10 years from now we have doubled per capita income for Palau, so on paper it looks healthy, but you go around you find 10 begging people that's not development to me. The Palau Resource Institute was founded by three university-trained women who hope to have an impact on Palau's development policy. For the environmental impact studies, we have felt that the, the socio-cultural impact study, uh, aspect of the studies have been neglected. It's, uh, not only is the environment important uh, when you, you do development, but the people in the environment are very important. And, so far, they're just, we, especially in Palau, we feel like the people are less important than our faces and our corals. We'd like to also reach the grassroots level, and so we are, we are a very grassroots um, institute. In Palau, uh, we always consider and we say that people are more important than anything else and that relations are more important than anything else. Sometimes uh, we do things slowly and maybe it's cumbersome and, and time consuming, but sometimes reaching your goal, whatever it is, the process is more important uh, than the actual reaching your objective because we've got to mind uh, feelings and relations and interconnectedness with each other. Just from what I hear of all these proposed uh, hotels and resorts, there is absolutely no way the Palawan people can support those developments. And so we're going to have to import a lot of people mm -hmm. and then turn the cycle, you know, just accelerate the cycle of more government, more spending, more foreign um, workers, a lot more exploitation of the environment. So I don't know. It just I think it's a it's a really tricky situation, and we need to really be careful.
Pwede mo sa marami kita time hindi yun old road old. Ali mo mo sa usin mo. Oo, oi. Ay ka ikid ya ka lam sel do lain di free ya ka do mar. Oo, ay sendiri. Malu. Mo di ya ka do lom. Alam mo kaya rin nga lang kaya alam mo itirin nga lang si. Itirin nga lang si. So real di peesa imo rin mo rin mapilin ay mga ula arkal mo ko. Eh imar na kaya kung tas yung namot ya ka o ika. Di lang nga rin nga rangod al at rangod al bulu men mo low si bartir e nga nga rin ni. At sikum di ebela mo dia. Palawan school children still have a lush environment to enjoy and learn to protect. But there is growing concern that without quick action, their generation may be the last to have those options. The warriors in those days were very vicious. And that the reason why you see a school of them is that together we stand, divided we fall. And that's the concept that has been used elsewhere, including the United States. I hope you won't forget this kind of introduction that I've given and that it'll be left uh, for a history that you learn something. Any question? Yes. Who's that? What? Well, in olden days, they do a lot of symbols uh, like that. Uh, Feeling their ancient culture is in danger of fading, some Palawan teachers are reasserting the importance of Palawan values in the educational process. <laughs> What do I value? Value the novela, I value the gadwa, I value the What should I do? I value the gold, value the material, I value the art. What should I do? Let's say you want to dollar sign, well, the dollar at cheap labor or less than that. I give them a call. I give them other people who are going to go to our house. I give them the chance to give them the plug. I give them the hump. I give them the way. I give them the act of harm. I give them the memory. I give them the paper. I give them the mask. I give them the glasses. I give them the hair. 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 Nakalchuri kita kau lagi mau showcase. Mau ketemu mak pedi ramai sih malam orang. Oh, the entertainer up. Entah kalau kita lama sebelum ni dulu. Eh, eh, mesti mau ini orang. Mas pilih siapa dulu lah. Atau macam mana? I think modernisation comes in. It's something that we can't really fully control. But if you really want to keep our culture, I think we should. Make the people who come in respect what we believe in and our values. Newspaper man politician Moses Uladong publishes Palau's only newspaper. As chair of Palau's master plan task force, and through his reporting, he works to help Palauans understand their nation's options for the future. We're one of the few countries in the world that uh, became independent with uh, sufficient resources to really make it better and uh, to be really be able to control our destiny, we'll be able to preserve our uh, culture and we'll be able to you know, uh, develop our resources to accommodate our needs. But we are the ones to decide. Now, if we don't have a plan like this, then we're going to subject ourselves to you know, outside forces or development that can you know literally run away you know, and take its own uh, direction that could be beyond our control we can follow what is happening in, in Guam and Saipan and develop this country uh, economically but I want diversification I want to diversify 
go into other industries, including maybe uh, offshore banking and all these corporate. Uh, but um, I think the main industry that we should promote is tourism. In 1982, Palau hosted 500 tourists. By 1992, the number had reached 40,000 a year and is still climbing. There are two ways of taking those lands by, by, uh, by a military uh, uh, basis or by these uh, hotel corporations that are being constructed all over the islands. The reason why there is tourism industry is because of the beauty, but the most, the biggest contributor to uh, pollution is national government. Because right now you put another uh, 200 hotel, I mean, that thing, that sewer system is not going to be able to handle it. And there's, there's Hyatt, there's Hilton, you know, with plants, you know, coming in to Palau. And there's other Taiwanese, Japanese, also interested in building hotels. So you put another 1,000 1, or 2,000 rooms here, I mean, we're going to just kill this uh, environment we have that attract the tourism. Palau's islands sit in a lagoonal basin that seemed until recently an endless source of seafood. Always there, free for the use of all. Many Palauans still depend on the lagoon for most of their daily food. Now the lagoon itself faces a number of threats. Poorly designed, hastily bulldozed roads like this one have created massive erosion in Palau's wet climate. Washing down hillsides, Topsoil smothers the mangrove swamps that are the nurseries for fish. Carried by runoff, the soil is silting in large areas of the lagoon's formerly open water. Consumer goods and their byproducts become trash. Discarded in Palau's national dump, they release highly toxic substances into the air and groundwater and into the lagoon and its sea life. Fishing hulks like this one, abandoned by foreign corporations, rust and sink. Their fuel tanks leak oil and toxics that form a scum on the lagoon's surface. Settling, the scum contaminates the sea life on the lagoon floor. Waste oil dumped by Palau's power plants adds to the toxic brew. Visibility in these once clear waters is dropping rapidly. Karor's outmoded and overloaded sewer plant, built in the 50s by the U.S. Army's Corps of Engineers, pumps one million gallons of untreated human waste into the lagoon daily. Its bacteria make fish unfit for eating. Its concentrated nutrients cause an overgrowth of algae, create a living blanket that is smothering ever larger areas of coral, destroying the lagoon's fragile ecology. Devon Ludwig is Karor State's marine biologist. His studies document the multiple threats that must be dealt with decisively and soon if the lagoon is to survive. The sea does have been adrift for a long time. There, there are artifacts that have probably come right out of the national dump. And they've been drifting for quite some time. And, and it also is what brought our attention to the fact that these currents just circulate. So it just shows you how these things circulate and what you think you've thrown away in the ocean in this location isn't thrown away. It comes back to haunt you. Our leaders doesn't educate themselves enough to understand we are so blessed and so lucky. Francis Terribian has made doing what he loves, scuba diving, into a successful business. 
Palau can become a model of the world if we do it right. So much to learn from environment. I take you diving, you want to go diving to the same spot every day and it's not the same every time. It's the same fish but they do a different story all the time. You see shark feeding uh, or shark running away from other shark or a big tuna chasing shark. I mean, you don't see that. You tell that. People say you're not telling, but you know, you're make, pulling our leg. But that's what's happening out there. We have di Japanese owners, uh, di dive shop owners here. They bring their own dive guide. They bring their own boat. They bring everything here. And the Japanese customers used to be my customers who are really bread and butter for my business. Are, are, are moved on. They went to the Japanese dive shop. And those dive jobs doesn't do a better job than I'm doing. It's said that the national government think different ways. You know, they allow Japanese to come here and do a job here. Let me ask you a question. You think you can go to Japan today and establish yourself? No way. And this government is not protecting the individual people. It's protecting some interest of their friends uh, who finance their campaign. The Storyboard Hotel in Peleliu is one of Palau's first locally owned eco resorts. It combines tiled bathroom luxury with traditional Palauan design using both commercial and local construction materials. Its creator, architect Lothane Sadao, aims to make it a successful model. I have a feeling that in three years from now there will be more of this somewhere else in Peleliu. The more, the bigger the hotel it becomes, the more, the five star the hotel becomes, that uh, if it's a Japanese then they demand the Japanese product, they demand the Japanese restaurant, they want a service to serve the people and what happens is that the community get left behind. Uh, I don't want the, the, the local people to just become a, sort of a servant to the hotel. We want them to see that their everyday activity have a lot to do, in fact, to do with a place like this. And, and when it's small like this, we can really control it. I believe that the economy will uh, go up based on a small scale project like this. It's conflicting. We're contradicting ourselves. We want to develop but we want to maintain our resources over long term we're thinking about future and that's the biggest challenge how do you balance those that's the, that's the biggest question noah Idaong equates survival of the reefs with survival of palawan culture because palawans are very close to their environment they're born and raised in the sea in the on the land and so they they can feel for the land if uh, something goes wrong then they can feel it that's what makes a palawan he developed research which supports fishermen's claims of shrinking catches. After presenting this persuasive evidence to village chiefs, he worked with them to revive an ancient tradition called bool, which forbids fishing during spawning seasons. That work led to passage of a sustainable marine resources bill, the first legislation in Palau's history that makes formal life-sustaining restrictions on fishing. You know, you are, we are still Palauans and we can still reach into our hearts and and help this uh, uh, maintain our, our resources as we, our fathers used to do. If we lose what we have, we can find it elsewhere. We're all part of this whole system. Nobody is better than the other. Nobody is more important than the other. Let's don't destroy each other or humiliate each other. Above all, if we are reflective of our own role and each other's role in the dynamic mystery of our lagoon, we will make our contribution to the creation of a sustainable world community. Mm -hmm.